Welcome back everybody to another Raise Game Fully video. My name is Jim, and this is another video I'm making in my Mistara Revisited series, where I take a look at different nations that existed on the old D&D game world of Mistara, and talk about the different nations and the products that, were, that fleshed them out and gave them a lot more detail that Dungeon Masters and players could use in their campaigns. Today's video is about Gazetteer 11, the Republic of Daroken, and it's different in many, many ways that I am very excited to share with you. Now, if you remember back to earlier videos in this series, I talked about how very often campaigns in Mistara would start in the Grand Duchy of Karamikos. And in that video, I talked about things that can happen within the Duchy and reasons how and why player characters would leave the Duchy. And I brought up a map here of the Grand Duchy and talked about different avenues that characters could take to venture beyond the duchy. And at the time, I didn't ex talk about the nation to the north, even though it was a very, very easy route for characters to leave. Uh, there's, in fact, a road that travels from central um, Karamikos up through the mountains into the Republic of Daroken. Here. The road from Karamikos to Daroken brings you to uh, a trading city on the very eastern edge and this is actually a really great first exposure to Daroken. It will give you a sense of how diverse and how spread out the nation is. Daroken was called the Land of Leftovers uh, because there were land grabs that happened hundreds of years ago and it kind of was just what was ever left, left over that people, other people didn't want. And Daroken is kind of pieced together from various different cultures, various different ethnicities, and it has evolved into the Republic that it is today. Before I get into the content of the Gazetteer itself and the, um, and the Republic, I do want to take a minute and talk about the flavor. On all these videos, I try to give you a sense of the flavor of the culture before we dive into it. Um, and the Roken is a little bit different uh, in that it, it is a republic, and most of the kingdoms or nations of Mistara are more based on uh, a medieval setting, maybe more of a medieval political system, and it feels that the Roken is based more on a late medieval, early Renaissance um, Italian city-state. Uh, similar, uh, maybe like Venice or Genoa or uh, Florence or even um, provincial southern France. Um, and it has that flavor to it. You see more, uh, in terms of military, you see more pikes and rapiers and uh, there's a very heavy emphasis on merchants and trade as opposed to something early medieval like uh, siege weapons and, and heavy plate armor. There's definitely a different flair to being uh, from Daroken. All right, having said that, um, I think this picture from the player's book really gives a great snapshot of uh, a typical day in a Daroken town. This is artwork from the Gazetteer done by Stephen Fabian, and it just shows a typical scene that you might see wandering the streets of Daroken. I always thought it was really great. In addition to this picture, I feel like there's a great quote um, that starts off the player's book to the Gazetteer. Um, and the, the quote is supposed to be um, the Black Eagle von Hendricks, the main antagonist of the Karamiko setting. And there's a short quote here that um, is put on the front page of the player's book. I'm going to read it to you. Um, and Baron von Hendricks is quoted here and saying, Daroken, phew, land of women. They have no stomach for conquest, nor a love of war. Why they prosper is more than I can understand. And that highlights a couple of great things. It highlights how Daroken is successful, why they're successful, and that it confused a lot of people who, by comparison, seemed backwards thinking. And um, the Black Eagle from... Karamikos is certainly one of those people. He's very narrow-minded. He's very evil and very um, selfish and greedy and kind of stuck in an old-fashioned way. And I thought that was a great way to paint 
Daroken as being some place that is a little bit hard for gruff, evil-minded, uh, conquest-driven characters to understand. I just thought that was a, a wonderful quote. All right, so let's get into the content of the Gazetteer book itself. As I mentioned, uh, The Republic of Daroken is Gazetteer 11. It was written by Scott Herring. And I'm going to start with the product itself. I am fortunate enough to actually have this one in print. I don't have too many Gazetteers in print. Uh, I do have this one. I'm, I'm super excited. Um, but the first thing, uh, when you open up the Gazetteer, as I have mentioned in the past, they come with large fold-out paper maps, uh, similar in nature to the ones here behind me on the wall. I took a photo of the paper map that came with the Gazetteer, but given its large size and strange shape, I'm going to switch to uh, a full screen for this. Here is a photo of the map of Daroken. Um, you can see the city I mentioned previously on the far east. Uh, the print might be kind of small. Um, the city of Salenica on the far eastern edge of Daroken. The heartland of the nation is the river in the center left part of the map and the valley that it encompasses and the cities and towns of that plain. Um, they've got excellent farmland and that is the heartland of Daroken. It has some other um, features that jump right out at you. Obviously the forest in the right center of the map. The forest is actually uh, an elven nation. It's a separate nation in Mystara called Alfheim. I will definitely get into that in a future video. But the entirety of the forest is surrounded by, uh, at least in name, uh, the Republic of Daroken. The parts to the north and northeast of the forest, while technically are part of the Republic, are infested and overrun with monster hordes. Um, they're very small to see, but you can see several fortresses on the right center part of the map. Um, and the Daroken people refer to this area as the Orc Lands. And in fact, one of the objectives of a Daroken-based campaign is to subjugate or cleanse the Orc Lands of its infestation and open it up for colonization. There's a mountain range to the south. Crossing the mountains brings someone to uh, either Karamikos or the Five Shires, nations that I've talked about previously. To the southwest is a large swamp, the Malfegi Swamp. The swamp is very much uncivilized, very untamed. Lots of uh, monsters that live there, uh, ghost stories from travelers about strange things that they see in the swamp. Um, but the swamp is kind of off to the side. If you notice the river and the road running from the heartland south uh, do reach a port. There's a port there that Daroken can send and receive um, ocean trade. To the west is a large lake, Lake Amserak. It's got several islands on it, um, and there are some forts and towns that skirt the lake. This is also part of Daroken. Directly north, uh, as the road runs, you'll see um, an orange and a white area on the map. Those are also lands that are inhabited by non-humans. There's orcs and ogres and goblins. Um, collectively, they are referred to as the broken lands because the terrain is just very inhospitable, uh, broken mountains. The road does run through the broken lands to other nations of Mistara. Um, it's a very, very hazardous trek, but it does exist. The large map also had some great illustrations. If uh, you notice on the top, there are some coins. Uh, one thing you'll learn very, very soon is that merchants are the power in Daroken, and trade is the backbone of the country. So I really appreciate the art that the uh, creators put here on these coins to describe the coins. There is a legend, of course, in the top right. Uh, the bottom left is a map of the port city of Athanos, the port that I just described a few moments ago. And on the bottom of the map, uh, there are topographical diagrams of the major islands in Lake Amserak. 
um, which we'll figure into adventures later on. Okay, so that was the large fold-out map that came with the product. I think I'm going to cut to this map here to give you a, a, a simpler diagram of where what the Roken looks like. Again, you can see uh, the large spot in the middle where the forest of Alfheim is. It's a separate nation, so it's not detailed in here. But you can see the uh, the heartlands in the center, Lake Amserak. You can see the uh, city of Selenica on the far eastern part of the map. And roads um, are on this map, but you can get the sense that roads travel uh, both north, east, and west from uh, the heartlands to bring trade to all parts of the world, which is something that uh, Darokin does very, very well. The inside cover of the product has a map of the central market of the capital city of Darokin. I thought this was neat, just a, a little layout. Oftentimes, many adventures happen in markets. Characters have to go there to interact with uh, merchants or meet contacts for whatever reason. And since mercantilism is such a big part of Darokin, uh, this map here uh, was very, very cool. The other part of the inside cover of the product showed a map of the capital city of Darokin, which is called Darokin, uh, sometimes called Darokin City. And you can see here how it spans the river. Um, the colored areas here on the map represent higher income neighborhoods. The caste system of the Roken is roughly broken down into um, descriptions based on coinage. So, for example, in uh, old D&D or, or Beckme D&D, um, the coins we used were the gold, silver, um, copper, and electrum. And in Daroken, the that's a rough translation for the caste system. So the gold neighborhoods would be the highest, the silver neighborhoods would be the second, second etc. So on the map here, the gold neighborhoods are literally gold. Um, the silver ones are the lighter yellow, and it shows different districts of the city, the walls, the guard towers, uh, just to give you a nice idea of what was where, uh, give you a little bit less work as a dungeon master uh, in creating places or adventures around the city. Before I get into the player's guide itself, I do want to show this um, came with the product. Let me go back to full screen for a second. This came with the product. I thought this was really, really cool. I never punched it all out to, to use it. It came with this um, little punch out horse and wagon model that you could build. The pieces here are to, to make a, a covered wagon and assemble it together. Um, I think it's because I never played with miniatures. Uh, I never really punched that out to use it, um, but it was a really, really neat uh, addition to the product that um, I did not see in the other gazetteers, but it was, uh, it was super cool nonetheless. Okay, getting into the player's book, and as I have mentioned before, some of the gazetteers had one book divided into two sections, uh, players and dungeon masters. Some of the gazetteer products actually had separate books. This one uh, decided to go uh, separate books. And this is uh, the start or the second or third page of the player's book. And they decided to take the approach, the author took the approach of introducing you to Daroken through a series of interviews with various peoples. So the section starts out with guides. Um, it interviews um, several different people. It interviews a senior member of one of the rich merchant families. Um, they talk to someone who's a dock worker, they talk to someone who's a citizen of Karamikos, who's a traveling merchant, and comes to Daroken frequently. And the different questions they ask um, all of these characters are, tell me about the people of Daroken, or tell me about money and business, tell me about uh, Daroken's role in the world, uh, tell me about the role of diplomacy. Uh, etc., etc., and it goes on. All these characters answer questions, they're um, boxed text here. Um, and it, it was just a really, really nice way to get a sense of um, how an NPC would describe this country to your PCs uh, if they were either in Daroken asking somebody. You could actually remove these and put them in a, a foreign tavern if you want. Uh, just to give you a flavor, let me read to you one of them. Um, so, the uh, question here was um, the people of Daroken, and this one is one of the rich senior members of the merchant family. 
And the, um, his answer is, I have found nearly everyone I've ever dealt with to be deliberate, serious, and hardworking. Competition in this country is very strong on all levels, and effort and dedication is the way to get ahead. But as I've grown older, I've started to think that many Dorokinians are missing something in life by the single-minded drive for wealth and success. Let me give you an example. I have traveled to nearly every city on the continent at one time or another, and in only a handful of them have I seen anything more than the inside of a trading hall. Now I sit here and think of the sights which I could have seen and the people I could have met. All those experiences were wasted because I was too busy negotiating for that extra 200 gold coins. I sometimes think I'd have been a better person if I had not worried about the extra money so much and taken the time to develop some other interests. And that's just one perspective on the people um, from that one NPC. And as you can see, he's both accepting of their merchant culture, but at the same time, he is aware that it's narrow-minded. And I just thought that was, uh, as one example, I thought that that was just a really, really great way to introduce people, uh, to introduce PCs to a new area of the world. Um, give them lots of things to think about. Don't just say, oh, it's a, it's a stuffy land of rich merchants. Um, you give them different opinions. And of course, uh, the player's book goes on to talk to other characters um, it asks them the same question, so you can get different perspectives here. This continues on um, the section with everybody, what everybody knows. And then the next section of the player's book um, talks about creating characters who are from Daroken. This is just a slight modification of the character creation process from the basic rulebook. I've talked about this uh, in my other videos to give if you wish to make a character from this nation, or even NPCs from this nation, you can use these tips and tricks to just give them a little bit of extra flavor um, that will differentiate them uh, from one nation from another. I think a good example of that was the quote I read you from uh, the Black Eagle. You know, he is not the type of person that can wrap his head around um, merchants or wrap himself or wrap his head around the concept of a republic where um, the populace elects representatives to form a government instead of a more medieval autocratic type government. So the player character section here, I won't go into all the details, um, it focuses of course on money as is befitting of a merchant culture. They can start with more or less money than the original um, character rules, and then it spends a great deal of time discussing skills. I touched upon this, I think, in my Minrathod video. Skills were kind of a afterthought to the basic game. They are probably, I'm not sure what they would be analogous to in 5th edition. I know in 2nd edition AD&D, they, they played with proficiencies uh, both weapon proficiencies and non-weapon proficiencies. Um, but skills are just things that kind of give your character an extra dimension. Um, and especially in a place like Daroken, where there is so much emphasis on um, producing something, selling something, being either a tradesman or a merchant, there are lots of skills that just a, a character from Daroken would just know. You might have grown up uh, in the family of money lenders. You may have grown up in more of a craftsman. Maybe your your family were uh, carpenters or maybe they were blacksmiths. There are literally, I, I think there's about 30 different skills um, which fall under the umbrella of profession skills that your characters can learn and are encouraged to learn if they are from Daroken. There are some skills here that are um, very, very prominent in the, in the Gazetteer. Uh, they talk, um, they are mentioned frequently. Uh, they are the skills of appraisal and bargaining. And there was a neat system developed um, in Mistara to appraise something's worth and then use your bargaining skill to haggle that price up and down. If you failed your appraisal role, and these are just die checks, by the way, you would just, um, because these skills are related to intelligence, they are essentially your intelligence score. 
and you would just roll a die 20 below your intelligence to succeed on an appraisal or a bargaining skill. And of course, these skills can be improved. But failing your appraisal skill was actually fun in a role-playing sense. It told you that your character misjudged the value of an item, and then to use your bargaining skill up or down, you're not even basing it on the true value of the item. And then whether or not you, whether or not the person you're interacting with can make their appraisal score and their bargaining score roles, um, it led to some really, really interesting role playing to determine how much something would be worth if you're trying to buy or sell something. Um, I thought that was a really, really cool aspect to the game. And then, of course, the merchants are a large part of Daroken society. They were given their own section here in the rulebook. Um, primarily because the player characters can become one. Uh, in addition to dealing with them very, very frequently, uh, just in the process of traveling the Daroken, you player characters can opt to become a merchant. And this is very, very similar to the system that was used in Minrathad where you had merchant princes that were a combination of, it was like almost like a, um, a dual class or a multi-class option. You could multi-class into a sea captain and use sea magic. Here in Daroken, you could use this option to become a merchant. And it gave you a separate experience point table. And you would only earn merchant experience points to advance as a merchant which was clever. So in effect, you were two classes at the same time. You were your base class, be it a fighter, wizard, priest, a rogue. And then you would add merchant to your character. And merchant experience is only obtainable by buying and selling of cargo. And you would use this table here um, to advance along uh, your merchant experience, where you would level up as a merchant. Um, and if you notice here, there were spells that were allowed as uh, a merchant. And these spells are really, really cool. They're very, very um, money and business oriented. Um, just as a couple of examples, a uh, spell to count coins, instantly know how many coins are in a stack or a pile. Uh, clear sight to have uh, clear vision along a trail. Calm horses. Detect ambush. Um, and then the higher level uh, spells are things like uh, resist magic, smuggling, embezzle, things to actually cheat and lie your way through either uh, a tax assessment or a business deal, which I thought was a really cool um, uh, angle to the, the game. There is a map inside the Gazetteer. Sorry for the size. It's, it's probably very, very small. Again, this is similar to uh, the trade map that came with the Minrathod guilds. And instead of showing the ports around Mistara, this map shows the cities of the continent and what items sell for more than market value and which items sell for less than market value. This was a, a super cool reference for Dungeon Masters. Obviously, the players wouldn't be privy to this right away. They would have to learn from experience. But once you learned that something was worth more or less, you could buy low, sell high, and you would be able to make uh, merchant runs uh, from area to area, and hopefully amass some gold and those merchant experience points. There is a section here that explains all that in detail uh, called Mercantile Trade, and it talks about um, how much weight animals can pull, um, the cost of buying and repairing and maintaining wagons. Um, it talks about different types of classifications for cities. Um, how big is a city? How likely are you to find a buyer for your wares, depending on how much you're transporting and what you're transporting? Um, there's a section here that talks about ports. Um, it does, doesn't go into the same detail as the Minrathod one, obviously, because the Dorokinians tend to stay on land. They don't tend to venture out into sea. But it talks about the types of loads that would be available to you at a certain port. Obviously, a larger city would have more sugar to unload. So um, based on port size, you would have a larger or smaller amount of um, goods available to you. 
and it goes into further detail about road conditions, things that can go wrong. Um, can your wagon break? Can it get stuck in the mud? Um, what are the chances of uh, ambushes, um, road conditions, terrain conditions? There's so many cool things that they put in here that really made the merchant its own class. You could really just be a merchant if you wanted to. I don't think it would give you too many skills that would be useful in dungeon crawling, but in terms of role playing and interacting with multiple NPCs from multiple regions of the world, maybe um, traveling and exploring the world instead of digging through uh, moldy dungeons for lost treasure, I think this merchant really is a class all by itself, and it the author did a great job uh, establishing that and making it interesting and fun to want to do. I'll just end the player's book with this little picture here of a, of a wagon coming under attack from Gargoyles. I always thought that was a great picture. All right, well, that brings us to the Dungeon Master's book. And again, it starts here with an introduction, um, tells you about the different books, and it, it gets right into a history of Daroken. And I think this was one of my more favorite histories just because it showed, um, it showed progress and it showed um, social and political evolution. It started with um, early settlers, um, farmers and homesteaders, how they became united under a king. And there was a kingdom of Daroken for quite a while. And then things just went wrong for the kings. Um, they were ineffective. They started a war with the elves, um, which didn't go very well. And then with, without heirs, the kings kind of lost their power and lost their pull and fell apart. And in that power vacuum, the merchants rose up. The merchants had the knowledge, the wherewithal, the money to kind of convince everybody that their way of life is the way that Daroken is going to survive. They're not going to um, defeat their neighbors militarily. A lot of them are much stronger than uh, Daroken. But this tried and true method that the merchants had been using for years of uh, buying and selling gave them influence. Nobody wanted to attack them anymore. There was just too much at stake. Nations wouldn't want to invade Daroken, or they wouldn't want to anger the Darokins, Darokinians, uh, for the risk of losing their trade connections. Uh, very, very similar to uh, those Italian city-states. And I just thought that was a really, really neat thing. Um, it summarized all this in a timeline that the, uh, all the gazetteers really, really did uh, nicely. But it was a neat way of showing how the merchants came to power and how the government is structured uh, in uh, the current day and age. It does get into a little bit of politics here in the Gazetteer. It talks about plutocracy, which of course is the government by the rich. Um, and it's funny because it's, it's accepted in Daroken. Like everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to be rich. And the rich are admired in Daroken. They are accepted as the uh, cream of the crop and it's just a really neat spin on it. Oftentimes, I think, studying history, uh, plutocracies are given a negative light, and I'm not advocating one way or the other for one or the other, but it's just interesting that in this setting, it's admired. It's something to be admired, and uh, it's something that, in fact, a lot of the Darokinians strive for. One other huge part of Darokin society centers around diplomacy. They have an entire core of diplomats uh, that they call the Darokin Diplomatic Corps, or the DDC. And the DDC is a very politicized, very organized branch of the government that interacts between the merchants' interests, the government's interests, and other foreign countries. The diplomats of the DDC wield a lot of power. Most of the time they're merchants, or they've got ties to the big merchant houses, and they can travel the continent and exert a lot of influence on foreign powers to both protect Daroken's borders and its interests. The section uh, goes on to talk about government and how different 
cities elect representatives. Those representatives go to Darokin and they meet in a, uh, a place called Merchant Guild Hall. And almost all of the elected representatives of Darokin are, in fact, merchants. They belong to one of the merchant guilds. And the guilds are both tradesmen and politicians. And they decide policy and they um, orchestrate truth movements with the generals. And um, it's just a different approach to uh, medieval gaming that very, very often were medieval and autocratic. I thought it was very, very interesting. There's a list here of military divisions. Um, this ties into the war machine rules that were in the companion rules, or if you have a rule cyclopedia, they would be in there as well. Um, this gives you basically army statistics for the entire nation. There's a section on crime and punishment. Uh, things that are illegal in Darokin are kind of the same things that are illegal in most nations of Mastara. Uh, theft, uh, assault. This continues, uh, this section spilled from government and goes into economy. And I didn't get too much into this um, just because it deals with some of the things I've already mentioned about trade relations, um, buying low, selling high, bodyguards, using magic to manipulate trade transactions, the use of bargaining and appraisal skills. Here is a great uh, illustration. This slide shows you the nine crests of the nine largest trading houses in Darokin. Obviously you would belong to a guild if you were a craftsman, um, if you were a weaver or a barrel maker, but you were also allied with your trading house. Um, and oftentimes the houses specialized in one trade versus another. For example, the Al Azrad house um, which is based in the eastern city of Selenica, trades in horses. They do a lot of business with animals and horses uh, based on their family's um, ethnic connection to uh, the nation of Laroam, which is where very fine horses are. But I just thought that that was a great picture there. Great section here on non-humans, um, especially in old D&D. There was a lot of emphasis on humans. And you really didn't have too many character choices aside from uh, humans and demi-humans. And this section here goes into some details describing elves, dwarves, and halflings and their roles in the Roken society. And if, you're, if you notice, there's actually a section here for orcs. Generally speaking, orcs are uh, enemies of the Roken people. They're usually monsters um, to be driven out or avoided, um, but there are some provisions, um, you know, based on what your dungeon master would like, or the role playing involved, that maybe orcs could um, achieve a different level of society or a different level of sophistication, so to speak, um, and integrate them into this merchant culture. Um, but it just gave a couple of different notes here about what each race uh, tends to do for trade, how they would fit into this um, Darokan society. One neat section here on society talks about charity, it talks about parties, there's a big social scene in the larger cities, especially Darokan city. In a, in a nation so focused on wealth and so obsessed with wealth, um, it's no surprise that there really isn't a whole lot of charity. You don't see a whole lot of handing out of money. Uh, people are very self-reliant in the Roken. They feel that, well, I've worked hard for my money. I'm not just going to give it out. So you don't see a whole lot of uh, beggars around the streets. They just, they don't survive. There's just no place for them to, to make any money. There is an exception, which is um, illustrated here on this page, which is the annual mast ball. And once a year, um, different societies or different houses host balls and donate some money to charity. And I guess that's their one tax write-off, if you will. But the masquerade ball um, is a nice little plot device. You can throw it in if the characters get invited to a masked ball. That could uh, open up some adventuring opportunities for them. It could also highlight 
some undesirable characters. You could um, illustrate somebody's pretentiousness, or you could illustrate somebody's um, disdain or scorn of other characters here. And it's just a great social environment. Uh, instead of always meeting up in the tavern and, and getting a, a quest from a wizard, you could always orchestrate um, a ball of some type, um, which is part of the Droken Society, to uh, lead the characters on an adventure hook. There's a calendar here as well. It's based on the Thaitian calendar that I've mentioned before. There's this nice little side story here about New Year's Eve, about parties in the streets. Uh, I thought that was a really, really neat little story. And then a large section of the Dungeon Master's Guide is a city-by-city city, uh, breakdown and, and tour of the nation, alphabetically. And it talks about each city, what you will find there, what's going on, current events, um, this is super, super helpful to me as a DM. I usually get my map open somewhere, and instead of just saying, oh yeah, you enter the city of Akoros, either making it up on the fly or, or just not even discussing it, just getting them in and out after a night's sleep, these sections of the Gazetteers were super cool, super helpful for describing uh, lots of stuff that's going on within each town or city that the characters visit. There is a section here about Merchant Guild's Hall, which is the uh, capital building, so to speak, of Daroken. Gave a nice little map. It's not that little, actually. I think it was two pages. And um, an adventure key. It keys out all the areas. I've always wanted to break into this building as a thief. I thought this would be such a great adventure if you could break into Merchant Guild's Hall. It's probably it's completely guarded with magic, but I always thought that would be a great adventure. Which brings us to adventures. There are several adventures in the back of the Dungeon Master's book, and these are adventure hooks that um, are similar to adventure hooks in other gazetteers that I've talked about. They um, are broken down by level, so basic adventures are for characters levels 1, 2, or 3. Expert adventures are for characters levels 4 to 14, companion 15 and to 25, and master level adventures for characters who are 25 and older, uh, <laughs> higher. And they're just simple hooks. Uh, you can use them to flesh out um, an existing adventure, or you can use them as an in-between distraction of an adventure. Um, I haven't in the past in my videos, I haven't gone through and talked about them. Uh, I do want to talk about a couple here, just because they're so cool, and I, I feel like it gives um, an added dimension to the Roken. I want to start with the adventure that's on the screen here, the Wanderer's grave and it's really cool because the characters come upon a document describing a impromptu burial site of a character that died up in the mountains and it's basically a treasure map that leads you up to the grave uh, and, and if they take the trouble to get up there they find that it's already been looted by some monsters some um, orcs or hobgoblins or something and you can actually um, track them down, find the remains. If you're there to recover the remains for somebody else and bury them, they're, they're here. Um, at any rate, the, uh, there's some loot associated with the body um, in the actual adventure printed here. It says that there are goblins involved. And there's a really cool magic item um, that's a staff, a wooden staff, and it's a staff of striking on one side and a staff of healing on the other side. And depending on which side you use to touch somebody, they are either damaged or healed uh, a certain amount. I thought that was a, a great short adventure hook for low-level adventurers. I do also want to touch on another great one here, uh, Works of Art. It's an expert-level adventure. It's a city-based adventure. And in visiting this city, you are wrapped up or you get involved in some type of social circle where you talk you see the works of this famous artist, a sculptor, and the sculptures are all the rage, everyone's always buying them. So the characters are either buying for themselves or they're hired by someone to go figure out just what the big deal is with these sculptures. Why is everybody buying them? Someone will hire them for that. And when the player characters find the, the sculptures or they go to the art gallery and see them, it's very unusual in that all of the sculptures are of people in um, poses of horror. They're all scared or shocked or, or frightened in some way. And then you meet the artist, and the artist seems nice, but there's a weird edge to her. 
And as the characters get involved and maybe explore the artist's home, they find out that she has this pit in, under her house where she kidnaps people and throws them into the pit. And she unlooses a cockatrice, and the cockatrice will turn these people to stone. And that's how she makes the statues, and that's how she sells them. She's, in fact, a, a horrible person and a criminal. And the player characters have to expose her. Um, I, I just love that adventure. I think that's a great, great little side hook. And especially in a city. I feel like cities get the reputation for places where adventures just don't happen. I feel like they're always a safe place, and... Um, to have a neat, short, twisted adventure like that was just a really, really, really cool um, addition to the, the Gazetteer. And as you get higher level adventures here, there's one to uh, tame the orc lands, a place I mentioned earlier. And then there's a whole section on sample NPCs. Um, they're almost all merchants, or they're almost always people that multi-class as merchants. Um, which is nice, it, it gives interaction as a DM if you're looking for that second level merchant who's just starting out um, and you want to introduce them to the party. There's a couple here that will do that. If you are a master level character and you want to meet somebody who's really part of the government, really the head of the merchant house, someone who's um, the top of their, their class, of their... Um, their guild. I mean, there's people here that the player characters can interact with as well. Um, on the screen is um, John's Brandeferth, uh, and he's a, uh, a money lender. He's a multi-class merchant fighter. Um, there are lots of great characters here. There's a town guard, Derek Venisi. There's a thief who is a beggar um, whose name is Rat. And he's not very popular in the city of Akoros. Great character to put in there. There's a cat burglar. Um, I, there he is there. Um, named Quint. He's um, like a thief for hire. Um, and there's other merchants in here as well. Corwin Linton is probably the second or third most powerful person in Daroken. He's head of Linton Trading House. Um, he's a really, really great character. Maggie Tremontaine is a cleric who's also a merchant. And then there's um, a traveling gypsy type merchant, um, Francino. There's a wizard named Rezac. There's just all kinds of great characters uh, for dungeon masters to throw into their uh, Daroken adventures at any point. And they run the gamut. They run the gamut, as I mentioned, from low level to high level. Uh, wizards and clerics and, and entertainers and beggars, uh, they all maybe dabble in merchant's trade. They can all give characters some advice on pursuing being a merchant, if that's what they want. And I'm just, again, amazed at the amount of material that went into this gazetteer. The material that was very, very different from medieval um, settings that appeared in other gazetteers. I just think that there was just a fantastic job all around with everything about Daroken. All right, well, that is it. That is the end of my video for today. And that was the Republic of Daroken. I thank you for watching. I will be making more of these videos soon, hopefully. It's been quite a while for me with my, um, with my Mastara series. I hope to get another one out soon. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this one. I enjoyed making it. Thank you so much for watching, and please remember to be kind to your fellow players.